Recording. Yep. Okay, good morning. I think you guys got organized in record time. <laughs> I'm surprised. You must be anticipating listening to a uh, a great presentation this morning and, and uh, things that are very important to us all, but I won't go into that detail now. So thank you for being here. It's a beautiful day to be here. Uh, I missed the uh, field trip last week. My wife, Cheryl, as many of you know, is under, had cancer treatments and she had her final radiation treatment on Tuesday last week. So uh, I, I opted to go with her rather than visit you in the on the dairy tour. <laughs> Smart move, huh? <laughs> okay. I, I will. <laughs> uh, open with some prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious day. Thank you for the opportunity to get together for fellowship and discussions, learn about things that are important in our lives that affect us all. I ask that you be with us as we go through this day be especially with those that are in need of your healing grace and comfort, those that are mourning losses, and just be with our international leaders as they deal with the strife that's in the world. I ask that you bless this day and be with us. Amen. Amen. And with that, Nancy, would you come forward and, and introduce our uh, speaker today? I just had the pleasure of meeting Michael Scross, who is going to present for us and learned that he's very local, like went to school across the street. So um, I in, have been involved with Fair Districts Pennsylvania for the last six years. Um, Fair Districts Pennsylvania is kind of a branch committee of the League of Women Voters. And we were working on fixing the fairness of the legislative maps over the last six years with I would say some degree of success is a long way to go, but they've certainly been improved. Since the maps can't change until the next census, we did have a body of volunteers who've been engaged with the process. So uh, Fair Districts decided we would focus on fixing Harrisburg. Um, don't just roll your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and in fixing Harrisburg, we're looking at the uh, legislative resolutions that determine how laws get made. And I've learned a great deal about that, but I know that Michael can tell us far more than I know. So it's my pleasure to introduce Michael and he'll tell us about fixing Harrisburg. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, as Nancy said, my name is Michael Scross and I'm a volunteer with Fair Districts PA for the past two years or so. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you guys about fixing Harrisburg. Our ask is that bipartisan solutions deserve a vote and I'm going to talk to you guys about how we can get there. So no matter what issue is important to you, no matter, no matter your political affiliation, um, this is something that should matter to you because it's very simple. It's demanding that we have a state government that does work for us and that allows our legislators to work together to solve problems that impact all of us. So nothing will change unless these rules that I'm going to be discussing shortly change. So our agenda is to first talk about the intent behind Harrisburg, how the government should work, uh, the sad reality of how Harrisburg currently is working. Uh, we'll go into some examples of issues to really illustrate the problems that exist. We'll talk about the rules specifically. And then most importantly, we'll talk about the fix and what we all can do to help promote reform. And I'll end with some action items. So first, we'll start with the intent behind Harrisburg. Uh, we like to call this our schoolhouse rock, like how a bill becomes a law. Uh, what in an idealistic world would happen in Harrisburg? So we want a representative democracy that is efficient, cost effective, and responsive to the people. Uh, I think we can all agree, correct, that these are pretty standard principles that we'd all like in our government. No matter what we want our government to do exactly, we should all agree that this is how we want it to operate. And we want it to be productive, most importantly. So we elect three co-equal branches of government, as I'm sure most of you already know. Uh, so we have the executive branch, uh, when we elect the governor. We have the legislative branch. So we elect 50 state senators and 203 state representatives, and we send them to Harrisburg. And then we have a judicial branch that interprets the laws. 
So the legislative branch makes the laws, the executive enforces the laws, and then the judicial branch interprets the laws. So how the legislative process is supposed to work. Keyword is supposed to work. So somebody somewhere has an idea. This can come from citizens, from the legislator themselves. It could come from lobbyists, whoever. Um, they come up with an idea of what should be done and they draft a bill. This bill in theory then would go to a committee. This committee might be the agriculture committee that focuses on specific topics. They would discuss and debate the bill. They'd make amendments, do some compromising, and then vote on whether to send that bill to the floor of the House. The floor then does the same. So the entire House votes um, on amendments, takes the bill's merits, and then they ultimately decide to pass the bill or not. If the bill does make it from the floor of the House, it then goes into a Senate committee, and they do the exact same process over again until it eventually might make its way to the Senate floor. If it passes the Senate, it then goes to the governor's office and the governor can veto it um, or choose to enact it and sign it into law. So there's several steps in the process and ideally throughout this process, the bill would be refined, compromises would be made and we'd have a solution to some problem that exists in the state government. So unfortunately, the reality is that we do have a government in action. So more than 80% of introduced bills never get any vote in committee. They don't go anywhere. They just sit there collecting dust. Yeah. Okay. The bills that do manage to make it out of committee, only 30%. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. So nearly 30% of the bills that do make it out of the committee never even get a vote on the floor. Half of the bills that pass one of the chambers do not get a bill in the next chamber. So if you add all those percentages up, the average percent of bills enacted per session is 6% in the House and 7% in the Senate. So nothing is getting anywhere. These bills aren't getting voted down, to be clear. It's not that people are deciding they don't want to pass these laws. They're just not getting any discussion or debate or chance to go anywhere. This is extremely unfortunate um, for obvious reasons, but it's especially um, troubling because we do have a full-time legislature. We have one of the largest in the country, so one of the most expensive, and yet it's one of the most unproductive. So this are just some numbers illustrating specifically um, in the past decade or so, as you can see consistently, less than 10% of bills that are written are passed. And it's both the same in the Senate, as you can see, less than 10% of bills that are introduced pass, and the same in the House. This has been the same issue for over two decades now. Every one of those bills has a cost attached to it. So there's a lot of time spent drafting these bills. There's a lot of legal teams that uh, work on drafting the bills. They have to be printed. There's a lot of um, copies and there's a lot of events and press surrounding these bills, all cost money. And eventually most of them just go in the trash, never to be thought of again. Specifically, uh, minority bills um, typically do not get enacted. So as you can see, uh, we currently have a legislature com controlled by the Republican Party. Um, so most bills that are enacted are from a Republican sponsor. Um, you can see in 27 to 2010, it was the opposite. That's because Democrats controlled the state legislature. And as we'll talk about, it does not matter which party controls the legislature. Unfortunately, it's the same story either way. Uh, we tend to get um, minority bills seldom passed in the House, and it is the same with the Senate. So ultimately, regardless of what party you're rooting for, what party controls the state legislature, we still will need reform. So this is a informative graphic um, that just really illustrates what is happening. So all those bills um, in the first step are the bills that are dying in committee. So as you can see, most bills that are introduced go nowhere. 
Um, specifically, 3,645 bills did not get anywhere during the 2019-2020 session. The bills that do make it out, once again, as we discussed, um, chances are they're not going to get a vote on the floor. Of the bills that do get passed on one floor aren't going to get passed on the other. And then the bills that do make it to the governor's desk uh, ultimately end up being pretty uh, small percentage of the total bills introduced. So rules should allow our legislators to work for us. So no matter what issues you care about, um, there's a ton of examples up here, very common sense bipartisan solutions. All of these bills, to be clear, have a Republican co-sponsor and a Democratic co-sponsor. They're not partisan bills. All of them are compromise bills that address issues that are concerning uh, both Republicans, Democrats, all Pennsylvanians. So as you can see these examples here, they were all denied a vote in both chambers and were not given the opportunity to go anywhere. So why is this happening? Why can't leaders reach across the aisle and work together? So first, there's an issue in the fact that majority and minority party members, they work in separate rooms. They don't talk to each other. They all work as one big group to decide what bills they're going to propose, what bills they're going to support or oppose, which bills are going to get anywhere. There is no collaboration or cooperation between the two parties, even though that is their job. There is no aisle to cross, essentially. Everything is done separately. Um, actually, in our state legislature, everything from like the IT staff and uh, the administrative staff is all separate. They're basically doing double operations because they don't want to work together. So one of the most troubling issues is that it is not a situation where there's you know dozens of legislators opposing bills. It's an issue where one of six majority party leaders can single-handedly block any bill they want. Regardless of any support, as we'll talk about uh, moving forward, these six leaders can block any bill they want. So the House Committee Chair, House Majority Leader, and the Speaker of the House can block any bill they want in the House. And then the Senate Committee Chair, Senate Majority Leader, and Senate President can choose to block any bill in the Senate from going anywhere, from getting any vote. So a perfect example is bipartisan redistricting reform, which I'll talk about uh, very shortly. This has been an issue that Fair Districts has been working on that has consistently been blocked despite having strong bipartisan support. So in 2007, 2008, it all started off when a redistricting reform bill had more co-sponsors than any other bill in the session, but it was blocked by a Democratic committee chair because they thought that Democrats might be drawing the maps in 2010, so they wanted to preserve their party's power. Now, coin flipped on the other side. Uh, in the past several sessions, there has been another bipartisan bill um, to create an independent citizens redistricting committee, which I'll talk about shortly and why that's so important. Um, this was bipartisan bill, one Republican, one Democrat, Senate and House. Um, Fair District's PA was launched in response to this bill. Um, to gather groups together to take on and promote this bill in public, to really build that public support. There was no legislative action. Same the next session, they decided a party leader um, did what we refer to as gutting the bill, which means they have a bill and then they take out the contents of the bill and replace them with something else. So then Fair Districts, for example, is going to have all these signs and um, papers printed with support, you know, bill number one. And what the party leader does is they change the contents of bill number one. So it does something completely different than it initially did. And now <laughs> there's all this papers and you know ads and everything out there saying we support bill one. Now bill one is something different because they did a little switcheroo. So that's what happened in 27, 2018. Ultimately no final action because there weren't bipartisan support for that new bill. Once again, 2019, 2020, no action. And finally, one last try this past session, this current session actually, um, same thing, the Senate bill was gutted, amended, installed, no final action. Uh, to put it in perspective, um, the redistricting reform bill had 110 bipartisan co-sponsors in the House. There are only 203 total members in the House, which means that there were enough people who were signed onto the bill, had they voted on it at any point, it would have passed because they had a majority of legislators supporting the bill which is almost unheard of. If you look online, most bills have a dozen or so co-sponsors. 
This bill had 110, but it didn't move anywhere because one person didn't want it to. So we are currently, we just completed the redistricting process under the existing rules. But I'll talk about it because it's not all bad. Uh, so just a quick crash course on redistricting and reapportionment. Uh, so by the results of the census that come out every 10 years, um, population figures change. So we must change our congressional and state legislative maps um, in response to those new numbers. Uh, so this past uh, census, we lost one congressional seat in the federal legislature. So we do redistricting. Um, so the federal government determines um, how many districts each state gets. Um, so the state determines the congressional lines. So in Pennsylvania, they just pass the congressional districts as regular legislation, which as we've just seen in the statistics, it's not going to end well. Uh, so they pass a bill establishing the districts for um, the new census for the next 10 years. Uh, Pennsylvania has had terribly gerrymandered districts in the past. As you can see, um, right in our hometown is the infamous goofy kicking Donald congressional district. Um, that was gerrymandered and was considered one of the most gerrymandered districts in the country. So there is a similar redistricting process for drawing state house and state senate districts, which we're focusing on today. Uh, so it's a commission of five individuals. Uh, the problem is that those individuals are chosen by politicians. So it's essentially like applying for a job and you're interviewing yourself. It doesn't make sense. You shouldn't be allowed to draw your own lines or pick a friend to draw the lines for you. But that's what happens. So there's a committee of five individuals, um, always two Democrats, two Republicans, and one, in theory, independent chair that both the Republicans and Democrats agree on. That never happens, so it always goes to the courts. Uh, so uh, the last redistricting cycle, uh, they appointed um, the Republican Supreme Court appointed a chair, and in this last uh, reapportionment session, the Democratic Supreme Court uh, appointed a chair, Mark Nordenberg, um, who did improve the quality of lines drawn. It was a better process, but it still wasn't an independent commission. So gerrymandering, if you don't know, is drawing district boundaries to benefit a party or candidate. Uh, so a simple explanation would be if you have one party that receives 20 votes, one party that receives 30 votes. As you can see here, depending how you draw the lines, um, you can kind of manipulate the outcome any way you want. Uh, so you can have it that the party that has 20 voters wins two districts, while the party that has 30 voters wins three districts. Most people would call this fair. Or you could do it that uh, one party wins zero districts, even though they should have won two, or that the party that receives less votes wins three districts and the other party receives uh, wins two districts. So basically with mapping technology, you can manipulate it to ensure specific people or specific parties win in a given seat. Often what we see um, in this past session was no exception is a sweetheart gerrymander where both parties agree to essentially give each other seats to protect themselves. Um, so they draw seats for specific legislators to ensure they win over and over again. Um, so it's not just the parties competing against each other, it's often the parties collaborating against us, essentially. So which one is worse, a Republican or a Democratic gerrymander? Don't answer, <laughs> Don't answer? it doesn't matter, exactly. So this is a great example. So right to the south of us, Maryland, um, the Maryland state legislature is and has been controlled by Democrats, um, and thus it's a Democratic gerrymander. Uh, so as you can see, uh, Republicans usually get, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the vote in Maryland. Um, but despite that, they only have one of the eight congressional seats because it was gerrymandered to favor the Democrats. Right here in Pennsylvania, up until 2018, it was the opposite story where Democrats would often receive a slightly higher share of the votes. And despite that, out of our 18 congressional seats, Republicans controlled 13 because of this beautiful district shown here. So no matter what state you're in, both parties do it. Um, and that's why it's so important to work together across the aisle to push for reform. So this really matters in state legislatures. Um, as you can see in Pennsylvania, Democrats uh, in 2018 won 54% of the statewide vote. But despite that, they only controlled 45% of the House seats. So this is happening both on the federal level and on the state level. And it happens in other states as well. 
So in the past 30 years, uh, Democrats um, have not controlled both chambers of the legislature at all. So three decades, um, Democrats have not had control of both chambers, despite the fact that Democrats have won the popular vote um, in at least half of the elections. So to sum all this up, uh, voters do overwhelmingly support redistricting reform for common sense reasons. Um, it puts party interests ahead of voters' interests, and it often helps create that gridlock that exists. By having fairer districts, ideally they'd be more competitive, um, they'd be more representative of each individual community, and therefore our legislature would be hopefully a little more effective. So there's a lot of popular support. Um, this is a poll that was conducted uh, by fair districts in 2019. As you can see, um, most people believe that gerrymandering uh, does allow party leaders to put their interests ahead of the voters' interests. They believe it creates this polarization and gridlock. Um, and only 18% felt that it worked fine and should continue on as it is. 67% of PA voters support an independent commission to draw state legislative districts, which is exactly what fair districts had set out to do. Um, and as I mentioned before, 110 state legislators in the House also agreed on this. But despite that, redistricting reform went nowhere, despite all this support. There were editorials, there were polls, there were resolutions passed, and yet it was never allowed a floor vote in the House or the Senate, because why would the party leaders want to give up their power? So what has fair districts done with this information? After trying to pass their independent commissioning uh, redistricting commission bill, they have realized that the issue is in the rules. And this is affecting lots of other bipartisan solutions, um, some of which are just, this is literally just a handful. Um, and these are really common sense issues. So pre canvassing bills, uh, this is something that a lot of county election officials are pushing for to allow them to count mail and start processing mail and ballots before election day to ensure we have election results as soon as we can. There is a ban, uh, or sorry, a bill on the gift ban um, to increase transparency in the state legislature. Um, it's been so around Harrisburg for over two decades now. It's received unanimous votes before, but it never crosses the finish line. Charter school funding, which I'll go into shortly. We have huge inequities in Pennsylvania, more so than any other state. There are bipartisan solutions to address it, but they go nowhere. I'll also talk about lead testing. Very common sense, has not gone anywhere. And something else, surprise medical bills, something we can all agree on, you would think. Bipartisan solution, one third of Pennsylvanians um, who are privately insured experience a surprise medical bill in 2021. But bills um, to prevent this, these surprise medical bills have been filed, but they did not go anywhere. School funding has also not been addressed. So we have um, the worst uh, school funding inequality in the nation. So all those other states are way ahead of us. Um, so the average for inequality um, is negative 15.6. We are at negative 33.5. Um, and this figure is the negative percentages. Um, so the difference between the poorest school districts and the wealthiest school districts in the state. So here is a graph of uh, per pupil spending on school operations. So as you can see, Pottstown is a great example. They are underfunded by almost $4,000 per student. So the issue is that there is no fair funding formula in Pennsylvania. Um, so we have the lowest in-state or statewide contributions to public education. A lot of it is done through property taxes for the local school districts. Uh, so our funding that does come from the state level, um, there is no fair funding formula that all the funding goes through to ensure that these inequities don't exist. So there was a proposal to have a fair funding formula to ensure that um, poorer school districts um, receive more money to balance out those inequities. Um, but there was a lot of pressure from school districts in rural areas which were losing students, meaning they would lose money from the state because there are less students um, for money to go to. Um, so they created a solution that nobody can get less money than they got the year before. 
<laughs> which means that there's really not going to be a solution unless we like double the amount of money. So what their solution was is any new funding goes through a fair funding formula, but that new funding is minuscule, which means that school districts, particularly in urban areas, are consistently underfunded because funding does not account for urban versus rural, whether there's a high population of um, ESL learners or special needs students. None of that is accounted for in the funding formula, which means that there's these significant gaps between um, wealthier school districts and poorer school districts. Another issue related to education is charter school reform. Uh, once again, there is a very simple bipartisan bill out there to address the funding issues with charter schools that are virtual. So they're receiving the same funding as brick and mortar schools, even though they don't have a school building to maintain. So you would think they should probably receive less money than the physical schools that exist. Um, but this is not the case. There is a bill out there to address it um, because billions um, or millions of taxpayer dollars are being sent to these schools that don't necessarily need the funding at the expense of other schools in Pennsylvania. Um, this bill has bipartisan support, but it has not gone anywhere because one or two people in the state legislature don't want it to go anywhere. What ultimately ends up happening a lot of the time is the courts are asked to step in when the legislature fails. Uh, so for example, there is currently um, a court case uh, that was recently um, addressing school funding. Um, so poor districts are forced to rely on property, property taxes to provide basic support and parents are often called upon to raise funds um, because the legislature has failed to act. So currently um, there is a Commonwealth court suit waiting um, a decision, but the legislature is spending millions of dollars on legal fees to defend themselves. So once again, there's all this money that's just going into um, Harrisburg for them to be ineffective. Uh, so another really common sense issue that has bipartisan support and it's gone nowhere is our response to childhood lead exposure. Um, so we have a lot of older buildings, which means um, a lot of Pennsylvanians are exposed to lead on a regular basis. Um, and every dollar of remediation for this um, issue of lead, so like lead paint, lead pipes, saves $200 in treatment. That's an amazing cost-benefit ratio. 18 PA cities have higher lead exposure levels than Flint, Michigan. And over 5% of PA children who were tested do qualify as having excessive blood lead levels. This can lead to developmental delays and learning issues down the road, explaining why just $1 of treatment leads to $200 savings down the road. So this is a map um, showing particularly rural areas are really hard hit by this issue um, with children having elevated blood levels. So it's really simple. There are lots of solutions addressing this that have been filed since 2015. Lead testing for institutions serving children, mandated testing during real estate sales, and a task force to recommend further solutions. These are all very simple bipartisan ideas to start addressing this issue. These proposals have all been stalled. Um, why is anyone against fixing this issue? I don't know, but they are. Um, and these have been stalled. Um, so most recently there was a bill that was unanimously voted out of the Senate, but it has not gone anywhere in the House. For years, these ideas are being proposed and they're not going anywhere. So why is there no debate or vote on these issues? Because the rules govern the process and the majority party makes the rules. So the rules specifically give party leaders the power. So one committee chair, as I mentioned earlier, can outweigh the entire House and Senate. The will of the people, and this creates a dangerous power imbalance. We elect 253 individuals to the state legislature, and we are giving the power to six individuals. That does not make sense. That's not a representative democracy. There's no transparency and there's no accountability. So what is exactly happening to cause this? So we vote on the rules of the session at the start of the session, as you would imagine. So they're creating rules to govern how they debate, how they vote, how they operate. So on the first day, House Resolution 1 determines the rules of the session. 
So first day of school, if they all go in, they're gonna vote on the rules. There's not ever time for public review, especially for new legislators. They don't really know what they're voting on necessarily, and there's no public input. The most concerning part is traditionally, they pass House Resolution 2 first. So they're passing House Resolution 2 before they pass House Resolution 1. Does anyone want to guess what House Resolution 2 is? Nancy? Well, I, I'm cheating because I forget. <laughs> um, House Resolution 2 is you can't change the rules in House Resolution 1. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so House Resolution 2 means that you can't amend House Resolution 1. So it's the party leaders, you know, kind of hurting the cats, if you will. Um, so trying to make sure nobody has any chance <laughs> to read the rules, understand the rules, or reform the rules. So by voting for House Resolution 1 and House Resolution 2 especially, lawmakers are giving up their voices and their ability to represent this, to represent us. They're putting their party before the people. No transparency, no accountability. So by doing this, where they pass a resolution prohibiting amendments on the rules before they pass the actual rules, um, local legislatures, legislators are ceding um, their influence to majority party leaders. So they're all complicit. There are, I'm going to do quick math. So there are 247 of them, and then there's six party leaders. They can all easily stand up to oppose these rules, but they choose not to. <laughs> so the rules are the problem ultimately because they are what is preventing these bipartisan solutions from passing. They're giving the majority party absolute control because the majority party leaders are writing these rules. And then the majority party leaders are selecting the committee chairs who also have say on stalling bills and making sure they don't get a vote. They're puppets, as you can see in this image. That's a great description. They're all just doing what their party wants them to do because that's easier. So the chairs are controlling the committee agenda. The minority party has no say whatsoever, which is creating this legislature where only a few people actually have power. So based on what you've heard so far, do you think your local legislator here in Chester County has any actual influence in Harrisburg? No. Nope. Does this sound like a representative mm -hmm. democracy? Probably not. So current rules do allow members to propose as many bills as they want. So normally we get close to 3,000 bills a session. It also allows those committee chairs to then ignore all those bills that are being proposed and written. It then allows the majority leader to ignore bills that are passed by the committee. And then it allows the chambers to ignore the work done by each other. So one majority party leader who represents less than 0.5% of PA voters has this power to stop any bill on their path. I think it's really important to hone in on that 0.5% of voters. It's almost random. Like chances are you're not gonna be that voter who's gonna decide um, whether to vote for that person or not. Um, so it is taking power away from the rest of us. So committee chairs who are appointed by the party leaders, as I said, can block any hearings or votes on any bill in their committee. And normally they're uh, collaborating with the party leaders to decide what they want to support and oppose. So based on what we've discussed so far, as you might expect, uh, we have what is considered to be an agenda fairness score of zero. Um, so uh, best practices for collaborative policymaking, um, which is part of a bipartisan policy, center, po bipartisan policy center has decided that Pennsylvania has no fairness um, in the state legislature it has no policies in place to ensure that bipartisan solutions get a vote. On the other hand, a state like Colorado has 100%. So let's see how Colorado operates. So in Colorado, um, almost at the same time we were doing this, they proposed a redistricting reform bill. They were able to pass it in less than one month. We are here six years later, still have not passed anything. So they introduced bills in April, they amended it in committee in May, and it passed unanimously less than a month later in 2016, just as we were starting our redistricting reform. This then placed a voter referendum on the ballot in November, and it was passed with 71% of the vote. Here is where our bipartisan redistricting reform bill has gone. As we talked about before, nowhere, despite having 110 House co-sponsors. <laughs> 
it was gutted, it was amended. They used different ways each session to kill the bill, essentially. So ultimately, we are still here in 2022 with no action to ensure fair redistricting in the future, whereas Colorado took them one month. Colorado also has a part-time legislature, by the way. So what difference do rules make? Uh, we're all, all spending a lot of money, time, energy, labor, resources, whatever you want to call it, on trying to push through really simple solutions that don't need all this work to push them through. This is the graph that was up earlier. There is clearly strong support for redistricting reform, and there's a lot of effort going into pushing it and passing it through the legislature. Um, but ultimately, none of this should be necessary, because if we had fair rules, we wouldn't have to put all this work in to pass some common sense policy. So, for example, over 100,000 Pennsylvanians signing petitions, over 1,000 public presentations, not including this one, uh, over 9 million Pennsylvania citizens, um, so 389 governing bodies, throughout 23 counties passed bipartisan resolutions themselves at the local level to tell their legislators to pass this reform. There's been thousands of calls and postcards. There's been editorials written. There was a statewide poll that showed that two thirds of Pennsylvanians support these reforms, but they've gotten nowhere. No action. And this is another example of a bill on nurse uh, license, licensure um, to ensure um, we are preventing nursing shortages. Uh, so it was initially proposed in 2018. This is the bill that did get through the session, but as you can see here, it took until it took four years essentially, and it was passed unanimously. Why is something that is passed unanimously taking four years to get anywhere? <laughs> this is 50 months in our state. It took both chambers to finally vote on a unanimous bill. It really does not have to be this way. Other states do it, why can't we? So rules changes to get these partisan forces, partisan thumbs off the scale, if you will, are possible. They already exist across the country. So our simple solutions are to guarantee that bipartisan solutions get a vote in committee, that bills that pass committee get a vote on the floor, and if they pass the floor, then they get a vote in the next chamber. This is a very simple ask. Other states do it, why can't we? But until the rules change, nothing else will change. So as you can see, we ran out of time um, to get redistricting reform through the state legislature, but we still have time to get rules reform through. So all that time we spent on redistricting reform helped get us to this point where we're prepared to really push for rules reform. So we started our Fix Harrisburg campaign in the spring. We're doing outreach right now, and we are currently just starting candidate outreach. Thanks to the new maps, uh, we have an opportunity, um, hopefully, to get this reform through. We have a lot of new state legislators who will be starting in Harrisburg in January. If we can convince all these people to get on board with rules reform, even if it's a small reform, we can get somewhere. So the Best practices that we're supporting are that committees must hear all bills that are proposed. Bills that do pass committee must receive a vote on the floor, allowing a majority of committee members to add something to the agenda of the committee. Why give one chair all the power if a majority of people on that committee agree to something? It should happen. Um, gavel is interesting. It's give a vote to every legislator. So every legislator can pick one bill that they really care about and ensure it gets a vote. Limiting the number of bills that each legislator can propose. Um, other states like Virginia do this. So instead of everyone proposing, you know, 100 bills that they know aren't going to get anywhere, they're forced to actually carefully craft legislation that they think can actually make it through the House and the Senate. There's also proportional rep representation on committees. So instead of committees favoring um, disproportionately the party in power, this would mean that the partisan representation in the chamber is reflected in each committee. And then having a chair chosen by vote of the chamber rather than party leaders. So all of these are different policies and rules that exist in other states that we are suggesting Pennsylvania could potentially implement. 
The problem is that legislative leaders, as you might guess, um, have no motivation to pursue these reforms. They have all the power, why would they give it up? So, how can you support reforming the rules? You can sign our petition at fixharrisburg.com and I'll pass out some pamphlets shortly. You can write um, an editorial and you can talk to legislators. That's the most important thing you can do is to talk to legislators and candidates, especially as we're in election season. Push them to favor rules reform. Um, this is a great opportunity because a lot of legislators, especially new legislators, aren't really thinking about this. It's something that's so unfortunately common nowadays that they just go and they vote for what their party tells them to vote for. Um, that if you start asking about this, they're gonna be a little shocked that people care about the rules. Um, so you can catch them off guard and really push them to support um, these really simple rules reforms. You can also do what you guys just did, is request uh, Fix Harrisburg to come speak to any of your other groups that you might be involved in. The more people on board, the better. Because citizenship is a contact sport. So the more events that are hosted on this topic, the more um, signs or buttons or stickers or um, anything where people say, Fix Harrisburg, what does that mean? All of that can help build support. It's a pretty heavy lift because legislators aren't going to be inclined um, to change the status quo. But despite blocking redistricting reform um, and despite all the public campaigns by so many different great groups, we did get better maps. Um, so we weren't able to change the law and get our independent commission, but we did get better maps because of all that public pressure that was generated. Because of those better maps, it means that the next election will probably be one of our most, um, will probably create one of our most responsive state legislatures yet because the maps were not drawn um, as heavily gerrymandered as they have in the past. They're pretty fair, which means that there's gonna be a lot of freshman legislators who are new. Several incumbents were um, knocked out in primary campaigns on both sides of the aisle, uh, which means that you're gonna have a lot of new faces in Harrisburg. There's going to be a lot of open districts and these people these new legislators can hopefully resist surrendering surrendering their power so conditions for change are more favorable than ever because of this so we can all be winners together um, so we are investing heavily in these public campaigns to build support for Hicks, fix harrisburg um, these are all very common sense solutions it's going to be hard to find someone out there that is gonna say, no, I actually think bipartisan bills shouldn't get anywhere. I think we should waste all this money and time and keep it the status quo. Most people aren't gonna say that. They might not be interested, but they're probably not gonna be against it. Uh, it's not an all or nothing uh, campaign. They're gonna be voting on the rules in January. Even if we get minor reform, that'll help kind of grease the wheels for the next reform that we might wanna implement. So every act of support is truly an investment in your own future. And you can start today by simply joining the Fix Harrisburg campaign. That means signing that petition. Um, you could join and sign up to volunteer with Fix Harrisburg and just telling people about the problem because most people are probably unaware. So doing whatever you can can make a huge impact in creating a more responsive state legislature. And with that, does anyone have any questions? I've got three items I'd like you to comment on. Okay. Uh, term limits versus career politicians, mm -hmm. uh, the influence of the teachers union and what does or doesn't get done because it's a very powerful union, mm -hmm. especially in Pennsylvania, and the lack of media attention to some of these problems like lead, the media seems to pick in my mind what they want to support and what they don't mm -hmm. support. And it's kind of appalling when in our backyard, we have problems here in the state, but we hear about things in the uh, other states mm -hmm. where they have water problems. So if you could just comment on those three things. Sure. So uh, I would say first term limits. Mike, can you repeat the question? That's, he's not on the mic. So the Zoom people. Sure. So the first question is um, commenting on term limits to prevent career politicians from developing. Um, so this is just speaking from my opinion. I don't think their districts or Harrisburg has a specific um, side on any of these issues. 
Um, but personally, I would say um, term limits aren't inherently a bad thing. I don't think they're a bad idea, but I don't think they um, address the problem as much as you might expect them to. Um, a lot of people in Harrisburg have not been there for that long. A lot of the party leaders are relatively new. It's not like um, what you see at the federal level where they've been there for like decades. Um, it tends to be a little bit more of a revolving door than our federal legislature. And despite that, we still have these issues. Um, so definitely not, I'm not against it. Um, I don't think it's, you know, it's definitely something to consider, but I don't think it would address the problems that exist in Harrisburg. Um, and then your next question was influence of unions. You said specifically teachers unions. Um, definitely, like regardless of what union it is, what they might support, um, all these uh, bipartisan solutions aren't going somewhere for some reason. So chances are that reason is because of, you know, one group or another um, heavily influencing a single leg uh, legislative leader in power. Um, that's really the only explanation for why some of these things don't move. Um, so definitely, yes, yeah, special interest groups, whatever they may be, whatever, you know, side of the aisle they may be, um, they do have an impact, definitely, because it doesn't, uh, you know, a dollar can go a long way at state legislative rates. It's not like Congress, where it might take millions of dollars in support. Um, and these things often kind of fly under the radar because it's the state legislature, so there's not as much focus on it, which goes into your next question about uh, media attention on these issues. Um, I think it's definitely... People are unaware of what's going on in the state legislature. There's not nearly as much focus on it or focus on these issues, which I agree is a problem. Um, but at the same time, I think it's an issue of, you know, everyone has lives and things they do, and we can't be watching Harrisburg 24 seven, of course. Um, but I think having more attention on these issues would go a long way because most people are just unaware because all the focus is typically on um, things that are more um, attention grabbing, um, or what's going on at the federal level rather than the state level, even though it's just as important, if not more important sometimes for certain issues. Does that answer your question enough? Is your group doing anything to try and get media to be more involved concerning these to the people? Yes, yeah, we're definitely, um, the big thing that we do is especially local um, outlets specifically, because local is usually better. You get more people's attention on um, issues specific to each area. So definitely fair districts and fix Harrisburg is trying to draw up as much attention as they can. Um, they'll do events in the Capitol um, specifically to get that media attention all in one day, for example. Um, and they're also trying to partner with other groups that have experienced stalled reforms themselves to try and uh, kind of leverage that power of different groups from different partisan affiliations, um, if you will, to try to get as much attention as they can. Yes. <laughs> It's always nice to hear from a fellow utopian. Um, <laughs> first comment I have is, you know, 80% of the bills don't pass. Mm -hmm. That's because 80% of them are flawed, they're foolish, they're too narrow, and they're there because the legislature wants to tell his special interest group that he introduced the bill. The second problem I see is the six leaders did not fall from the sky. They were elected by their party. And the problem in Pennsylvania and most states is we have two parties with a winner take all. So there are tens of thousands of people who are disenfranchised because either in the primary or in the general election, they had nobody else to vote for. Uh, the Green Party, the Libertarian Party, they get four, five, six percent of the vote. If we had a legislature with some at-large people where if you voted five percent for the Green Party, they got five percent of those legislators, you may have a system with four or five parties where a coalition would have to be put together because you don't have a majority party. And that's a reform that really should be made rather than tinkering with where the district lines are drawn by independent uh, voters. So yeah, your first uh, question, uh, I would say with the so many bills, as you mentioned, like aren't getting passed, but they probably shouldn't get passed. Definitely, which is why the limiting the number of bills that can be introduced, because you're right, a lot of the bills are very specific and the legislator knows they're not going to go anywhere. So they are just doing it as like a 
show to a specific person of, look, like I propose this, even though they know it won't go anywhere. Absolutely, that is something that is happening. Um, so hopefully rules changes. Um, if we did, did pursue something like limiting what you can actually propose, um, could help prevent that. But most importantly, the focus is on the issues that do need to be addressed and aren't going anywhere. So bills that, like you mentioned, probably are just written for one specific person, they wouldn't, hopefully they wouldn't, if these rules were implement, implemented, go anywhere because they wouldn't have that support necessary to move. And as to your second point about you know, larger reforms, um, yes, uh, and I think the issue is though, if it's so hard to get these really tiny things passed, it seems unlikely that those reforms are necessarily gonna move anywhere. So if you know, do one reform, that can help the next reform, which can help the next reform. And ideally it would be a um, kind of momentum that would exist. Yes. Well, related to what Dave was saying, um, one of the bad effects of the rules the way they stand now is that legislators are not being forced to actually vote on bills. Mm -hmm. They can say, oh, blah, 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 but they never have to actually sit down, raise their hand and say, I vote for or against because the committee chair has conveniently or whoever uh, stuck it under his, under his butt in the, uh, uh, under his chair. Yes, absolutely. I think I should yeah, address that because that is exactly what is happening is that's the point is to avoid voting on those controversial issues so you can maintain your majority by, you know, that one legislator in a competitive district, just don't make them vote on anything controversial. Exactly. That definitely happens. Or they can lobby in the committee to get it out of the committee where they know full well it will not get a vote mm -hmm. in either the House or the Senate. Yes. Um, the one issue, it, uh, issue that I've heard discussed that doesn't go anywhere is financial disclosures. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pennsylvania has some very, very squishy and lax rules about what legislatures have to post, whether they have to keep their websites updated. I mean, even some of the very prominent people in the legislature mm -hmm. Their posting of financial contributions are like two and three years in arrear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they get a lot of support from a particular industry, as an example, the chances that they might vote in favor of or against, you know, but if that had to be disclosed, perhaps the voters would have more understanding of why the legislators are voting as they are. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. How many Republicans and Democrats do you have? For the uh, redistricting reform, yeah, hmm, I don't have the exact number. I could get it for you, um, but it was several. It wasn't just one, like Republican and all Democrats. Yeah. Um, and off the top of my head, I could say if there were 110 co-sponsors and there were only 80 some Democrats in the House at that time, which means there were at least 20 Republicans wow. co-sponsoring it. I think there were more than that. I, I, yeah, yeah, I have the numbers. So, yeah, but it was at least, it must be at least 20 because it was a majority. And I think that's because a lot of the Republican representatives were realizing that they couldn't get anything mm -hmm. moving. Yes. Because of the way that the. Mm -hmm. So the Democrats are running that place. No. 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 Absolutely the opposite. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, as Nancy just mentioned, the issue, like all of these, everything that I mentioned has at least one Republican who also cares about it. So exactly, these legislators realize they don't have any individual power either. So a lot of them should be inclined to also support this so they can actually effectively, if they want to effectively legislate. Not all of them do, but if they do, they would want to vote for these rules because their own personal priorities aren't getting anywhere either. Yes. Do you have an opinion about the way the state constitution is recklessly handled with all these different amendments? The, uh, oh, I see, yes, the, so this is not kind of separate from the rules. Right yes. It said there are 80 mm -hmm. possible. I mean, you're just taking a document and changing it, your will for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's hard to get people to actually, question. oh, the question was on um, a comment on all the amendments to the state constitution. Um, we'll probably have several we'll be voting on, you know, in the next year or so. Um, I don't have a specific comment, but I would say it's um, an ineffective way to address issues is to just keep throwing it 
on the ballot. And it's often written in a confusing manner that voters aren't necessarily understanding. Often it's voted on in a like municipal primary election. So you're only capturing like 10% of eligible voters. Um, so yeah, there are a lot of issues with kind of, and like I mentioned with the court system as well, a lot of these issues are supposed to be addressed by the state legislature. And instead they're getting pushed off into more effective, ineffective ways of addressing the issues rather than the state legislature just doing their job. Yes. The other thing with the, the current uh, initiative on, on <clears throat> constitutional amendments is that they're using that as a way to prevent the governor having any say mm -hmm. in the process. Um, they've been able to promote in the last 10 years a number of issues by being very loud about something that they knew the governor would veto. So they could afford to be loud, but it still wasn't going to change anything. Mm -hmm. Some of the constitutional amendments are, are pinpointed so that that checks and balance would be eliminated from the state, yes. um, which again, disenfranchises the voter mm -hmm. because they have voted for all of those representations, all of that representation. Yes. And I would add, there is, I know, um, specifically one legislator, she's a Democrat, um, Lisa Boscola, who's pushing for referendums, which would be different from these constitutional amendments in that voters would actually be able to come together and put something on the ballot themselves if the legislature isn't willing to act. Anything else? David, you said there's nobody against these reforms. Well, I'm friends with the gentleman who used to represent this district in mm -hmm. Harrisburg. And he was one of the few Republicans that was in favor of reform. Mm -hmm. He got sideways with his own uh, leadership in Harrisburg. And the Democrats worked actively to remove him. Mm -hmm. They signed up hundreds of transient students at Westchester University, lied to him that he was a Trump supporter, and he lost by 25 votes. Mm -hmm. So in this case, both parties worked mm -hmm. to remove absolutely. somebody who was for reform. I, oh, absolutely. And as I mentioned at the start, like redistricting reform almost happened in 2006, if it weren't for one single Democratic chairman preventing it. And now, it's, you know, the coin is flipped. So now Democrats are pushing for it. And who knows, in a decade, Republicans could be pushing for it and Democrats, you know, not. So absolutely, it is both parties. As we've seen in other states, it doesn't matter the party. They're both going to do it. They're both going to try to give themselves power. And there is absolutely lots of legislators who do oppose this because it's easier this way to not have to vote on stuff. Um, and to just kind of exist in the legislature rather than do the hard work. Um, but there are enough legislators on both sides who are clearly proposing bills that they want to get somewhere and would be supportive of this. Um, but definitely there is opposition to it. And I agree. It is both parties who are contributing to the problem. Yes. Who's running that office? The Democrats or Republicans? The state legislature. Oh, it's legal women voters. League of Women Voters. So it's, it's non It's League of Women Voters. Yeah, it's non -partisan. Yeah, this group is non yeah. Chuck, Chuck and Cross are running. No, what? neither. Running what? Neither. Neither, Chuck. It's independent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And there are no politicians being endorsed by the group. There's no specific issues being endorsed by the group. These are all just examples of things that exist out there. The group isn't taking a specific position on any of the specific bills that I've mentioned. As I gather from your presentation, the group is really focused on rules reform. Yes. So that's that it. Yep. Then the legislators can do the work of the people yes. as opposed to the work of the party. Absolutely. Nancy? So I think some of the people here might have the question, so what can I as a voter do mm -hmm. to support the initiative to change the rules? Yes, and I will pass out these um, cards that have a QR code to do um, sign a petition. But the biggest thing you can do is to ask your candidates before they, um, before you elect them, to ask them if they support these reforms, especially if you have um, a new candidate on your ballot that's going to the state legislature for the first time. Informing them of these rules, you'd be amazed at how many candidates we reach out to and they have no idea. Um, so talking to them um, and then calling and emailing your state legislators who are already in office and talking about this issue. They're going to be surprised that people are actually paying attention. Um, and that's um, hopefully going to create some more meaningful conversations because they won't have 
a rebuttal already proposed for you. So definitely reaching out and trying to actually talk to the state legislators to show that you care about this issue can help generate reform. Yes. How, how much of a difference would it make if the federal government <laughs> enacted uh, voter reform, which is a, huge, a small possibility, I understand. <laughs> but if that did occur, could they say that gerrymandering must be eliminated? Well, they independent have to, uh, uh, the constitutional. So, okay. the, I mean, gerrymandering at this point, we're, you know, we have the districts that we're going to be using for the next 10 years. And they're, even though they weren't drawn by an independent commission, they're pretty good districts. Um, so, there's probably not much um, that the federal government would do that would really impact this specific rules reform um, at any point in the next decade, at least, because we already have the lines that are established. That we're going to elect people on um so it really has to come from the state level i would say it has to come from individual people in these districts pressuring their state and um state house and state senate representatives michael thank you for uh, a very informative presentation thank you and i think while this is recorded if you want to refresh your thinking on what work the uh the fix Harrisburg uh, effort is about go back and review the recording the recording will be up though this time about a week later because Lynn our chief technologist is on vacation well deserved time off so usually she has it up by on Wednesday but this week this time it'll be up next week when she gets back from vacation so th that will give you some time to think about this and Michael will pass these yes. cards up thank you for bringing that mm -hmm. it's something that if we want change to happen, we have to get involved and communicate to Harrisburg, to our legislators. We can't let sit back and hope somebody else does it for us. So I encourage you to get involved via phone call or an email, go to their website, send them an email message or a, a message through their contact point on their, on their website, or when you see them personally, let them know your views on this fix Harrisburg thing. That's how that's how things will get done. And I think as as Dave Walter mentioned, you know, there's probably a lot of bills that don't deserve to be a bill. But some of the the rules changes that Michael talked about of having, you know, limit the number of bills that a particular leg that any legislature can introduce so that they're focused on the real issues. So with that, thank you, Michael, thank for you. Do you have any announcements to make today? No, I don't want to. Okay. And uh, so with that, enjoy the beautiful fall weather and uh, see you next week. Oh, what's the program next week? I didn't bring my schedule with me. Uh, Anybody got it? <laughs> oh, it, it's family service, right? Executive director. Yes, yes, that's what it is. Service the, the family service. The family service one yeah. is on next week. I think there's two presenters on that. I think it's a Mark Butler is one. Mark Butler. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. I, I'll issue an invitation. Um, the Chester County.